I picture one day there being at the 8.30 Mass, there being a group of kindergartners sitting, sitting over here listening to this gospel passage and thinking, how in the world will I ever make this meaningful to kindergartners? But this morning's gospel, as well as tomorrow's, is just chock full of ologies, theology, Christology, eschatology, soteriology. Don't worry, we're never going to cover all of that. But let's try to explore at least a little bit of it. Now, to provide a little bit of context, if we remember from yesterday's gospel, this discourse from, from Jesus takes place right after he had healed the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath, and that's when the Jewish, exercise, Jewish authorities got all exercised about his having done this. Um, this is Jesus' response to their accusations against him for having healed on the Sabbath. Now, first... Jesus uses the third person, and he explains that the Son can do only what the Father does. Then he, discuss, he discusses this love between the Father and the Son, and explains that as the Father gives life, so does the Son. Finally, in this little subsection, Jesus explains that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, Jesus' emphasis on the love he shared with the Father was, this was actually an early revelation of the love that exists among the Trinity and a love in which we are all called to share. And I'll get to that towards the end. But let's look a little closer. The Jews understood the Sabbath to apply to everybody. God, of course, they understood, this, this they understood quite well, did not completely cease all of his work on the Sabbath. And they deduced this from the fact that people continue to be born and to die on the Sabbath. Therefore, there were two things that God clearly did on the Sabbath. That were thing, and these were two things that God himself was the only one he could do on any day of the week. And that no one else could do on any day of the week. These two things were to give life and to pass judgment. Those who were born clearly were given life and those who died were subject to judgment. So when Jesus says that the Son can do only what the Father can do, he was creating a divine equivalency between the Father and the Son. And the Jews picked up on this right away. Then Jesus tied the Son even more directly to the Father by explaining that whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now in those times, they had a very clearly developed notion of delegation when a delegation was sent by a given authority. To, you know, to, to, to visit someone else, whoever received that delegation was expected to treat the delegates exactly as they would have treated the sender himself. Then, in the part of the discourse that I think is the most important for us, Jesus tells them, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but has passed from death to life. After reiterating that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, Jesus then removes all doubt about what he was saying. Up to this point, he'd been referring to the Father, whom the Jews would have understood to mean God, and to the Son, whose identity might not have been so clear. So Jesus now pronounces in the first person, not the third person as he started out. He says, I can do any, I, I cannot do anything on my own. I judge as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. At that moment, Jesus expressly was announcing he was the son of the Father, the son of God. And you can imagine how the Jewish re authorities reacted to that. Let's just say it didn't go over as well as one would hope. For us here, what we need to understand while the mystery of the Trinity is ultimately never fully comprehensible to us, it is, after all, a mystery. It's also simultaneously incredibly important for humanity. And again, because it is so difficult, Jesus is beginning to introduce this idea just that there even is a Trinity to them and that this Trinity exists in eternal love. We were created to share God's own life. And since God's life is this eternal communion of love among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are thus called to share that same eternal Trinitarian communion of life and love. The Trinity is the goal of human life, and it gives meaning to our entire existence. Only our full participation in God's Trinitarian life 
perpetually and completely, which is what would happen in heaven, can ever satisfy our hearts. The Trinity is the answer we seek, the fulfillment of our hopes and the satisfaction of our hearts. And following our Lord, as he tells us, whoever hears my word and believes in me, or believes in the one who has sent me, has eternal life. Following our Lord, since he is the way and the truth and the life, that is the only way for us to get there.